let's solve some of the practice problems for NET physics from the chapter of measurements. So here we have first question that says that the dimension of the energy density is the same as that of we have pressure, force, velocity squared and acceleration. So what do we know about energy density? Well, we know that the energy density is defined as energy per unit volume in three dimensions. So what is energy? We know that energy can be computed from force times distance. And what are the units for force times distance? So the dimensions we know for force, it is M times A and M is kilograms. A is meters per second squared. And what is distance? It's meters, right? So this thing gives you kilograms meter squared per second squared. So that's your energy. What about uh, volume? Well, we know the units for volume are simply meter cube. So let's see what is the units for energy density then. We have kilograms meter squared per second squared divided by meter cube. So this goes with this and you're left with one meter and you have kilograms per second squared divided by meters. And this thing is just kilograms divided by meters second squared. So these are the units for energy density. So now we, we, can, we know that force, we know force does not have these units. It has kilograms meter per second squared times meter. We know acceleration does not have these units. We also know velocity squared will not come to these units. So what about pressure? Well, we know uh, pressure is defined as force per unit area. So what are the units here? So the units for force are kilograms, meters per second squared. What are the units for area? We know that its area is a two dimensional thing. And so we have meter squared. So this meter goes with this and we come back to kilograms per meter second squared. So these units match with each other. And hence the correct answer is option number A, pressure. Next, we have this question. Question number two, which says uh, the, we have to compute the product of 5.0 times 10 raised to power 4 times 3.0 times 10 raised to power 6. So it's all multiplication, right? So we know what is 5 times 3. We know that's 15.0. And then we have into 10 raised to power 4 into 10 raised to power 6. Well, you see that the basis for this 10 raised to powers are same so you can just add the powers and so you get 15.0 into 10 raised to power 4 plus 6 is 10 and so you get 15.0 times 10 raised to power 10. Well look at our options we have a part 1.5 times 10 raised to power 9 b part 1.5 times 10 raised to power 11 c part 1.5 times 10 raised to power 10 and 1.5 times 10 raised to power 21. So first thing you immediately see is that none of the options have 15.0, but instead 1.5. So we see that in our options, the decimal place is shifted towards the left compared to what we computed, which means that the 10 raised to power will actually increase with one. So we'd have 1.5 into 10 raised to power 11. So that option is option number B. So the correct option is B. Next question we have, question number three, for what physical quantity is Pascal a unit of? So what do we know about Pascal? Well, it is a unit for force divided by area, right? And we know immediately what is pressure. Pressure is force per unit area. But what do we have in option? So you don't directly select B, but you see we have all of these as an option as well. So let's check. What is stress? We know stress is defined as force per unit area as well. So the units for stress in this 
would be Pascal as well. What about Young's modulus? We know Young's modulus is defined as the ratio of stress over strain. But so we have stress, so we have Pascal's. What about strain? Is strain dimensionless? If so, then Young's modulus would also have the units for Pascal. So let's check. But for that, we need to know what is strain. Well, strain is defined as the change in length divided by the original length, which means that the units will cancel off. Units will cancel off. So I cannot just cancel this thing. The units would be meters over meters and which would cancel out. So we would be left with, in Young's modulus, the only units coming from is stress. And hence, all of these quantities have the unit Pascal, right? So the correct option is option number D, which says all of these. Next, we have this question, question number four. 1024 can be written in scientific notation as, and we have these options, and immediately we see that option B and D and even C, they do not make sense when you look at 1024. So you don't have 1024 in here anywhere. So the only option that you're left with that is sensible is this one, option number A. So let's check 1.024 into 10 raised to power 3. So we know if we have a positive sign with this power, that means you have to shift decimal place three times to the right. So we have 1, 2, and 3. So this gives you 1, 0, 2, 4. And that's option number A. So that's the correct option. Next, we have question number five. In any measurement, the significant figures are, we have four options, all accurately known and all doubtful digits, only accurately known digits, only doubtful digits, or all accurately known digits, and the first doubtful digit. So from what we learned in the lecture video on measurements, we know that the Significant figures for any measurement are all accurately known digits and the first doubtful digit. So the correct option is option number D. Next we have question number six that reads, a digit zero in a measurement may be significant or may not be significant. B part always significant or always insignificant. And finally, significant only if left to a significant figure. Well, we know that the uh, obviously they are not always significant. We also know that they are not always insignificant from what we learn in the lecture on measurements. And what about significant only if left to a significant figure? Well, that's not true either. We know that a digit zero can B or it cannot be significant, right? So the correct option in this case is option number A. Next, question number seven. We have number of significant figures in 0 0.0173 are, we have three, four, five, or two. So we know from our rules on significant figures that we'll ignore these two zero and we'll start counting from here that the first non-zero number one seven three so we have one two and three so we have three significant figures in this digit and so the correct option is option number a next we have question number eight that reads, smaller the least count of the instrument, more is the measurement. We have options accurate, precise, accurate and precise, or none of these. Well, we know by definition that precise means smaller least count. But what about accurate, right? Uh, what about accuracy? Well, ac some, if something is accurate, that means that it has smaller percentage error. So the answer cannot be accurate and it also cannot be accurate and precise because precise is defined 
as something having a smaller least count. So according to the question, the correct option is option B, meaning that more smaller the least count is, the more precise the reading will be. Next, we have question number nine that says the number of significant figures in this number 15.0 is or are. We have A part 2, B part 6, 1 or 3. Well, we know according to the rules of significant figures that we'll start counting from the first non-zero digit. So we have 1, 5, and we'll even include the zero on the right side of this decimal point. So we have one, two, and three digits. So the correct option is option D. Next we have question number 10. When comparing systematic and random errors, the following pairs of properties of errors in an experimental measurement may be contrasted. So we have P1, error can be possibly eliminated. P2, error cannot possibly be eliminated. Q1, error is of constant sign and magnitude. Q2, error is of varying sign and magnitude. R1, error will be reduced by averaging repeated measurements. And R2, error will not be reduced by averaging repeated measurements. Which properties apply to random error? So what do we know about random error? Well, we know that random errors, they can, uh, they cannot be eliminated, right? So random errors cannot be eliminated. So P1 is true. What about uh, random errors? Do they, are they constant or do they vary? Well, they're random errors, right? They're random errors. So they, they don't have a constant sign or a magnitude. So Q1 is not true and therefore Q2 will be true because they are varying sign and magnitude. What about uh, the average part? So, well, we know for a random error to reduce random error, we can simply average over all our measurements and use the average value to reduce the error. So R1 says error will be reduced by averaging repeated measurements. So that's true. So which pair does this belong to? We have, we have P2, we have Q2, and we have R1. So that's option number B, right? So option number B is the correct answer. Next, we have question number 11 that says, which equation is not dimensionally correct? So we have not dimensionally correct. So we have E equals MC squared, S equals VT squared, B equal, B, VF equals VI plus AT, and then we have S equals half AT squared. So let's first eliminate the ones that we are familiar with. Well, we know E equals mc squared. This is Einstein's energy mass relation. So that equation must be uh, dimensionally correct. Then we have Vf equals Vi plus At. We are, no, we are familiar with these, this expression as well. Uh, this is valid for constant acceleration. Similarly, S equals half At squared. We are familiar with this expression as well. What about this one? This looks odd one. So this is the odd one out. Well, we know S, the units for S are meters. We know the units for V are meters per second and the units for T are second. So the squared of this T squared would simply be second squared. So let's check. Well, we can immediately see that if I put in place of S, I put its unit meter equal to V is meters per second and T squared is second squared. So what I get, I get seconds cancelled with one of these seconds over here and you get meters seconds. So you can see that these are not equal and hence the correct option for the equation which is not dimensionally correct is option number C. Right? So it's this one. 
Next, we have question number 12. Which experimental technique reduces the systematic error of the quantity being investigated? So let's start with option number D first, timing a large number of oscillations to find a period. Well, obviously this will reduce your error, but you're uh, timing a large number of oscillations. And this method is used to reduce not your systematic error, but random error. So this will not work. What about this one? Measuring the diameter of a wire repeatedly and calculating the average. Well, again, you're computing the average and so that you do to reduce random errors. So that's not going to work. B part is measuring several internodal distance on a standing wave to find the mean internodal distance. Again, you're computing the mean, right? So this is not going to work as well. This is for random errors. What about adjusting an emitter to remove its zero error before measuring a current? So we know that zero error is a form of a systematic error and you're reducing or removing the zero error. Hence, you're reducing your systematic error. Hence, the correct option is option A.